This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Thank you, Ralph, for that nice introduction. I thought I would break with tradition and present a case. Uh, the case is uh, Wendy Harpum. Uh, she happens to be here today. She came all the way from Texas to be with us today uh, to uh, help us tell the story. Wendy, um, in 1990, 1990, was a 36 year old internal medicine physician, a mother of three, who developed a lump in her groin. A lymphoid biopsy at that time showed follicular lymphoma, stage three. She entered a, a heavy duty chemotherapy program called Promace MOP and went into a complete response. Shortly thereafter, she had a recurrence in the chest and had radiotherapy. Uh, we call it mini mantle, referring to the part of the body irradiated. And then a year later, she had another recurrence in 1993. She heard about a clinical trial of a monoclonal antibody uh, going on here at Stanford. Uh, an e East Coast lymphoma expert recommend going with what was proven, calls the people at Stanford Mavericks. She decides to join the trial. So in 1993, she received, she was one of the first patients to receive uh, what we called at the time IDEC C2B8, later become, became known as rituxan or rituximab in a phase one trial. And she had a partial regression of her tumor in that trial. Now a phase one trial is not designed to find activity, it's fi designed to, to find the right dose, to find the safety and toxicity profile, but she had a response. Uh, that response lasted a year, and then by that time there was a phase two trial going on at Stanford. She re-entered that trial, and at that time had a complete response to the same agent. Uh, a year later, she recurred and had some more chemotherapy with a complete response. Then in 1997, two years later, she recurred again, and she entered another phase two trial that was going on at that time with the same monoclonal antibody. She had a complete response. A year later, uh, she had another recurrence and was treated again with rituximab and had a complete response, this time, this time lasting for seven years. In 2005, she recurred again and was treated again with rituximab together with GMCSF, put her back into a complete remission where she remains today in 2007 on maintenance therapy with rituximab and GMCSF, now 17 years from her original diagnosis. So the things to notice here, and the things that I'll go over in the talk, are that this is a monoclonal antibody which causes remissions in patients with lymphoma. It can be used repetitively, and uh, it can be used together with other treatments. And sometimes it even works better in a subsequent uh, uh, try than in prior, uh, previous tries. The seven-year remission that she had in 1997, uh, in 1998, in contrast to the prior remissions which lasted about a year. Now, my first patient didn't look like Wendy Harpum. My first patient looked something like this. Uh, this is a mouse, a nude mouse, a really ugly mouse. Uh, it wasn't my patient. It appeared in Nature in 1975, and it, it kind of got me hooked because this mouse has been injected with some uh, human colon cancer cells that are growing in this tumor on its side, and it's also been injected with a radioactive antibody, not a monoclonal antibody. We didn't have them at the time. This is a polyclonal uh, produced from a rabbit serum. Uh, radio label and inject it into the mouse, and look what happened. The antibody went to the tumor. And that told us that uh, you could use antibodies to localize tumors, to bring things to tumors, and actually uh, latch onto tumors, and maybe, maybe even treat tumors. So that uh, got me going, but at the time, when I started as a faculty member here at Stanford, it was common knowledge that antibodies could never be drugs. They were, had all kinds of problems. They were heterogeneous. They were inconsistent. Every animal made a different batch. They were big molecules. They're not small molecules. They're proteins. They need to be administered parenterally. They can't be taken orally. Uh, they don't get inside cells. They just get on the outside of cells. They're hard to make. They're foreign and maybe even too specific. So here we are uh, a couple of decades later with a whole panoply of antibodies that are drugs in the pharmacy that we use every day. So the solutions were monoclonal antibodies to solve the problem of heterogeneity. We have the same antibody today that we had 20 years ago, exactly the same molecule. 
Uh, because it's a big molecule, you don't have to give it very often. It lasts a long time, has favorable pharmacokinetics. Uh, it's, a, it's true that it needs to be administered parentally. That seems to be a problem, but it's also a solution for some people who, who benefit from that. Uh, it doesn't enter cells, but it turns out you can do a lot of things from the outside of cells. Hard to make? Well, that got solved, and now it's a platform technology. So the next antibody is easy to make. We know how to make them. Uh, and foreign protein, that got solved by making them into human antibodies. Too specific? We can make cocktails of antibodies and rec recreate a, a specific mixture. So we now have a whole series of monoclonal antibodies in the clinic, uh, approved by the FDA uh, in these particular years. I've ordered this by year, and you see that it's out of date already. Just to make the point that we have a whole panoply of antibodies with a variety of names against a variety of targets for a variety of diseases, not just cancer, but also autoimmune diseases, transplantation, infectious diseases, um, asthma, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, it's going to be an expanding list. The pharmacy is going to get full of these things as uh, we go into the future. So how did this all begin? It began in 1975, at least I start the story there, the story goes back much before that, when Kohler and Milstein, two scientists in, 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 in England, who wanted to know how the immune system works, took a mouse and immunized the mouse with a foreign antigen, got the cells from that spleen of that mouse and made antibodies, and fused them together with another cell called a myeloma cell that's a tumor cell that lists, has the property of immortality. These cells uh, taken from the mouse will die in a few days, but if you fuse them to this immortal cell, the hybrid cell will last forever, and it'll make the antibody that came from that cell from that mouse. Now, the rule here is one, an one cell, one antibody. The immune system is wired so that we have a panoply of cells, each which makes a different antibody, and we have in our serum a whole mixture of the products of all those cells. So if we capture each cell one at a time, we have one antibody, a monoclonal antibody. Now, if one cell, one antibody is the rule, then one malignant uh, B cell, one antibody. But we have many copies of that exact same antibody produced that by that original cell that became a tumor. So one cell, one antibody is the rule for the normal immune system. Uh, one cell, one tumor becomes many copies of that same antibody uh, in the case of lymphoma. So the idea that we got was we would make antibodies against antibodies, so-called anti-idiotype antibodies, monoclonal antibodies against the product of one person's tumor. And that one person's tumor could be potentially treated or detected uh, or diagnosed using this custom-made antibody. And so we have a target on the tumor cell that's not on any normal cell in the body. And that was exquisitely specific and sensitive, and in animals worked to treat tumors, and uh, Richard Miller, the fellow at the time in my lab, and David Maloney, the student in my, uh, at the time in my lab, and I got the idea we would use this to treat a patient. So we went to our boss and asked them uh, what we should do. <laughs> and uh, Saul Rosenberg, uh, always good for advice. Uh, he hates this picture of himself. I love it. <laughs> this was not the expression on his face when he gave us this advice. <laughs> so we went to our other mentor, Henry Kaplan, famous uh, cancer researcher at Stanford, the founder of radiotherapy certainly at Stanford, one of the founders of Stanford Medical School. And he, he gave me this advice. He said, it's very important that the experiment work the first time. <laughs> I think he was talking about one of his own experiments. Uh, but I think he was also warning us that we were taking a risk. So the experiment that worked the first time is shown here. This is Mr. Phil Carr. He was 67 years old when we treated him. This is a picture from TV Guide magazine five years later when he was 72 years old, uh, leading the way to a cure for cancer. This is his x-ray. You don't see these x-rays anymore, but we have CAT scans now. In those days, we did what were called lymphangiograms. Uh, it doesn't project very well, I think, here, but I think you get the idea that uh, radio-opaque dye is put into the lymphatic channels of the feet. It percolates up into the retroperitoneum, and you can outline the size of these lymph nodes enlarged in the retroperitoneum. And there's even more that you can't see up in here. Uh, after being treated with this custom-made monoclonal antibody, he went into remission. And that's shown here. These lymph nodes have now shrunk down to pretty much normal size, from big foamy, foamy nodes to uh, smaller nodes. And um, he had a dramatic response. No side effects. This was a mouse monoclonal antibody. We made it right upstairs 
in this building and injected it into him and he had this response. So we went back to Henry Kaplan and, and he said, well, you're going to have to do it again. <laughs> so David Maloney presented Grand Rounds shortly thereafter and presented the second case, which also worked. So over the years, we made 50 different custom-made monoclonal antibodies for individual people with lymphoma, treated them, and most of them responded. So Richard Miller and I started a company called IDEC Pharmaceuticals. It became very hard to do it upstairs here on the second floor of this building with students and postdocs to go through the process of making a new antibody for every person in the clinic. And uh, if you think it was hard here at Stanford in the lab, in the research lab with students and postdocs, it got really hard when it became a company with all kinds of regulatory affairs and quality controls and FDA considerations. And as always happens, I think, founders get kicked out of companies they start. Uh, the company gets its own ideas of what they want to do and they divert away from the original idea. So they got tired of this idea of making a custom product. They wanted to make a one-size-fits-all, one antibody for everyone. And so uh, they decided to make an antibody against this target called CD20. CD20 is a, a B-cell antigen, had been discovered in Boston by um, Schlossman and Nadler. It's on all normal B cells and on all tumor B cells. So you can make one antibody and it'll hit a, a CD20 target on everybody's lymphoma. One antibody for everyone. I thought it was a terrible idea. Uh, it would hit the normal cells. We lost all of our fancy specificity for the tumor cell. And uh, we parted ways, the company and I. Uh, Wendy Harpam arrived on the scene about that time when we started the first phase one clinical trial with that antibody and she was one of the first patients who received it. She responded, as you saw. Uh, we went on to do a phase two trial, find a dose, find a schedule. I don't know if it's still the optimum dose and schedule even today, but this is the data from the phase, the pivotal trial that was done uh, nationwide, 166 patients. Uh, there's an overall response rate of about 40, 48%, a complete response rate around 6%, and this data got the drug approved by the FDA. Now, part of the reason the drug got approved on data like that, which wasn't compared to any other treatment, just flat data, is that it had very few side effects. And uh, Charles Schultz knew this, um, but Wendy also expressed this sentiment. When she got treated and was uh, sitting around that night thinking, she said, and I quote from her, could one single treatment that, doesn't, that didn't make me bald or sick really get rid of malignant lymphoma? Could we hope for a remission? And it did. So there were a number of surprises from this story. One is that um, the antibody worked at all and it caused regressions in lymphoma. Another surprise is that uh, it got rid of normal B cells from the blood and from the body, shown here an aggregate of data from, from the pivotal trial, showing the measurement of normal B cells in the blood that disappear from the blood as soon as you give the antibody and stay away for six months to a year. Now, who thought that it would be safe to get rid of your B cells for a year? Not only from the blood, but from the bone marrow and from the tissue compartments. Uh, who thought that this would be safe? Uh, you would think you need your B cells to make antibodies and people don't lose their immunoglobulins, they don't get infections, at least during this time, and it turned out to be very safe. The other surprise, as you saw with Wendy's case, is sometimes when you use the drug again, you can get a better response in a subsequent time, here in aggregate of data, the duration of response for people who respond a second time compared to the duration of their response, uh, tumor response that they had the first time. We don't have any other cancer treatment that works better uh, second or third time than it does the first time. And this is kind of interesting. This is a su surprise, and maybe there's an explanation for this. So we reported the first clinical trial uh, results at the ASH meeting in 1993, and we uh, put out a few more papers during the succeeding years. Uh, the FDA approved the drug in 1997 for a very limited indication for low-grade lymphoma patients who had failed conventional chemotherapy. But once the drug became available and was on the shelf in the pharmacy, then all hell broke loose. Then the real collaboration between industry and academia uh, began. Because investigators came to the company with ideas, the company came to investigators with ideas, and there's this two-way exchange of information and ideas that drove the field, and the publications over this ensuing couple of years skyrocketed, and it's continuing to this present day. The ASH meeting last year, we had over 200 abstracts presented 
on uh, various ways of using this drug, this antibody. Uh, coincidentally, maybe not coincidentally, this is the stock prices of the two companies that were involved over that period of time. And I think what it goes to show is you don't have to have inside information to make money in the stock market. All you have to do is read the medical literature. And you have all the information you need to make wise investments. So the ideas that people worked on once the drug was available, uh, how about upfront therapy to delay or avoid chemotherapy in low-grade lymphoma? How about adjuvant therapy to, to use it after chemotherapy? How about combinations with chemotherapy or with other biologics, as you saw with Wendy Harpham, or with other monoclonals to make cocktails? Or how about maintenance therapy, as she's receiving now, as you saw? How about just giving it forever to keep it, uh, the, the uh, lymphoma from coming back? Well, now we have phase two and phase three data uh, indicating that most of these things work. And I'll show you a couple of examples. This is the famous study done in France where patients were randomized to re receive uh, the standard chemotherapy cocktail with or without the addition of the antibody rituximab and shows the superiority of outcome of the patients who had the antibody added to chemotherapy. This result really changed uh, practice throughout the world and has become uh, now confirmed and extended by others and has become the standard therapy for this disease. This is Sandra Horning's data with her collaborators in the ECOG where they used it for follicular lymphoma after chemotherapy. So the standard chemotherapy, uh, the people were randomized to receive maintenance with Chocomab or not and shows here the duration of staying in remission, the superiority of receiving the drug or not. And even overall survival is being impacted by the addition of the drug. Here's a study from the Mini Pearl Cancer Center from Hainsworth and colleagues who used rituximab instead of chemotherapy up front for treating low-grade lymphoma patients and shows the duration of, of staying in remission uh, from using just rituximab as the primary therapy for low-grade lymphoma. And so these patients have, up to this point in time have never had to have chemotherapy. Then it really got interesting. Other diseases. Uh, this is a short list, actually, of the other diseases that rituximab has found now by investigators approaching the company to do their trials. Uh, some of them diseases that we would have predicted uh, because they're due to lymphocytes, lymphoproliferative diseases and transplant uh, patients, even Hodgkin's disease, Sjogren's syndrome, diseases due to uh, pathogenic antibodies like ITP, TTP, autoimmune hem hemolytic anemia, and some of these others. But who would have predicted that this drug that eliminates B cells would have worked in rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, or lupus. We didn't think that those are diseases that were caused by B cells or antibodies, but now in retrospect that the drug works, everybody's saying, oh yeah, we knew it all the time. B cells are always uh, known to be important. And the list goes on. Just last week in the New England Journal of Medicine, a very interesting paper on pyphagus, a very uh, debilitating uh, blistering disease due to an autoantibody with a very short course of rituximab putting people in remission and staying in remission. Uh-oh. <laughs> now we're in trouble. <laughs> At least I pay my bills on time. <laughs> How does this drug work? Uh, this is a, a slide that Wen Kai Wang put together that nicely summarizes the various theories about how the drug works. It could bind to the target on tumor cells and deliver a death signal. It could bind to the target and, and attract complement, which chews on the membrane of the cell. It could attract other killer cells, but that bind to the back end of the antibody molecule, the receptor called the FC receptor. And it could force the tumor cell to be taken up by other cells digested and presented to the immune system to induce an immune response. There's some data for, uh, uh, for all of these theories. I think the best data is for the theory right here, having to do with the FC receptor. Although if you remember the responses that occurred longer the second time or third time than the first time, that could be explained by this mechanism here, which essentially immunizes the patient against their own tumor and boosts that immunity when you expose them to the drug again. But this FC receptor turns out to be important for the action of the drug, as Wen Kai Weng showed in this data here. Turns out your genes, your inherited genes for a polymorphism in that receptor, that FC receptor, whether you have valine homozygous or phenylalanine heterozygous or phenylalanine homozygous at that position in that receptor, uh, you might have an 80% chance of responding to the rituximab uh, if you're a homozygote 
or a 40% chance if you carry one of the other alleles. This is pharmacogenomics. It's an example of picking a drug based on your genetics, uh, but we don't use this as a test to pick the drug or not, because after all, it's a pretty non-toxic therapy, and a 40% chance is not bad. So we don't use this test clinically to pick patients, but what it did do is give us evidence that this is the mechanism by which the drug works, gives us a way potentially to make a better drug. And so we, now we have a whole another industry of companies out there re-engineering their antibodies to bind better to this uh, unfavorable form of the FC receptor to try to improve the drug. And we have four second generation antibody products against the same target, CD20, one of which is in clinical trial here at Stanford, led by Kristen Ganju. And we hope that we're going to see better versions of, of this first uh, prototype antibody. Not only that, so that's improving the FC portion to bind better to the receptor, uh, improve the, the binding site to bind better to the target, but a whole bunch of other antibodies against B cells for lymphoma patients that are all in clinical trial in various stages, each one a different company, each one searching for a clinical investigator or a bunch of investigators, uh, each one being uh, thought about as a potential target for therapy. And some of these targets, like CD40 uh, and CD80, are much better choices than the original CD20 choice uh, because we know a lot more about them and about their function on B cells. So Ranjan Advani, for instance, here at Stanford, has a trial open with anti-CD40, uh, which is showing extreme promise, actually, in patients who have failed the usual chemotherapies. So antibodies are drugs. That is a fact. Uh, we will see replacements for rituximab. Rituximab is the biggest selling cancer drug in the world. It's $4 billion of sales last year worldwide. You can see some of the reasons why. But I think that we're going to have replacements. It's going to be hard to replace something that's so well established. The, the trials are challenging, but I think we have uh, ideas about how to make this drug better. And those ideas don't come from the first company. They come from other companies and other people. We're going to have new diseases to treat with this drug, and you saw that list. Uh, that list is going to get bigger, and we're going to learn more about how it works and how to predict whether it's going to work and how to maybe even upstage chemotherapy. After all, no one likes to get chemotherapy. So at this point, I want to tell you that a lot of people, I've summarized in a very short time now, the work of a lot of people. These are the people who've worked in our lab over the years in our group starting with Richard Miller, who's here in the audience, and David Maloney, who treated that very first patient. By the way, Mr. Carr, that first patient, I talked to him about a year ago. He's now in his late 90s. He's uh, free of his lymphoma, and he sends his regards. Um, <laughs> these people, maybe the top of the list, worked on the stuff that I talked about today, uh, maybe a few others down, but uh, the bottom of the list here is working on the new stuff that I haven't talked about today, and maybe I'll talk about the next time I give grand rounds. But this is a large group of people, and it's hard to summarize uh, the essence of these people. But some of them you can see here in a lab meeting. This is a Levy lab meeting in February in California. This slide is an excellent recruiting tool in Boston and New York and Minnesota. <clears throat> David Maloney is uh, famous. David Maloney is here. Uh, Tina Marie Lyles, who, uh, who uh, Wendy will recognize here the nurse uh, who worked with us at the time. These people have gone on to, uh, at least the ones who have left Stanford, some are still here. Uh, these people have gone on to very successful careers, not only in academia, but also in industry. And bringing back the point that this is a collaborative enterprise, we're training people not only to be professors, but also to be biomedical scientists, uh, and industry is an excellent place to do that these days. And so, um, this, this interchange between industry and academia is an important one. It's one we rely on to develop new drugs and new treatments for our patients. Now, two fellows uh, from those early days, uh, current picture shown here, uh, Richard Miller and Sandra Horning. I couldn't get them into the hot tub, but uh, the, they are, in a s essence, they are bookends on this story. Uh, Richard, who pioneered uh, the first uh, development of the antibodies, who started the company IDEC, who has been a faithful member of our faculty uh, up to the present day. He was in clinic yesterday seeing most of the patients so I could prepare this talk. Uh, Sandra Horning, who, who with her collaborators throughout, her academic collaborators throughout the country in the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, has made this drug uh, standard practice and extended its, uh, its uses uh, in the field of lymphoma. 
They are bookends on this story of academia industry collaboration. By the way, they're husband and wife. So at this point, uh, Ralph likes quotes, I've noticed. So I decided to pick a couple of quotes for Ralph, which seem appropriate at this time. So these are two baseball players, one from the 30s, one, one from the 40s. Both pitchers, they, they played for some of the same teams in their careers. Uh, Dizzy Dean, uh, it ain't bragging if you done it. But Satchel Paige, uh, more, uh, more eloquently, don't look back, someone may be gaining on you. And we wouldn't want to have it any other way. We want people to gain on us. We want uh, people to upstage what we do and to go beyond what we've been able to do. The two quotes that I picked that uh, have inspired me in my career uh, are from Saul Rosenberg and Stanley Schreier. I think Stanley's here today. Saul's on vacation. That's why I could show the funny picture of him. <laughs> uh, Saul uh, gave a grand rounds that I'll never forget, where he showed a picture of himself at the Taj Mahal, a picture of himself at the changing of the garden in London, a picture of himself in, uh, snorkeling in some great place. And he said, what do these pictures have to do with, with uh, with uh, our, my career, he said, the, the uh, secret is pick one disease, study it well, and it will take you to the ends of the earth. <laughs> I pass that, uh, that uh, pearl along to our current trainees. But even more profound, Stanley Schreier one day, I think passed me in the hall. He probably wasn't even talking to me. He was probably talking to himself. He said, <laughs> he said we own this disease which seemed kind of strange when I first heard it. <laughs> but the more I thought about it, you know, at the end of the day, what do we own? We don't own the drugs, we don't own the treatments, we own the disease. We think about it we, when we wake up, when we, when we go to bed, uh, we, uh, we, uh, it's our hobby, it's our profession, uh, it's a monkey on our back, it's what we want to try to solve, and uh, we'll keep working, working on it till we do. And uh, I want to end with Wendy, a quote from Wendy Harpum, uh, who I'll introduce to you in a second. She says, uh, the textbooks are wrong. As long as there is research, my type of lymphoma is not incurable. It is one of the types for which scientists are working toward a cure. Uh, Wendy has had a new career. Uh, she's a prolific writer and speaker uh, on the subject of cancer survivorship. Her books are wonderful, and I recommend them to you. I have one here to show you. And uh, with that, I think I'll introduce Wendy to make some remarks and to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Maybe will there be uh, Well, while he's getting his slides, I want to let you know that it is a huge honor to be here this morning. I told Ron that I travel all around the country lecturing about survivorship, and I really don't get nervous anymore. But I, I am, was so nervous and excited about coming here today. And what he asked me to do was give you a glimpse of the patient side of this research. There we go. Thanks. Okay. Um, my work around the country now centers on what I call healthy survivorship, the survivors from the time of diagnosis and for the balance of life. Healthy survivors are survivors who get good care and who live as fully as possible. And Ron Levy's work, Dr. Levy's work, is very responsible for me being what I call a healthy survivor. Um, before my illness, I was one of those very lucky people getting to live my dream. I was happily married. I had three healthy babies. Darn cute, don't you think? <laughs> and I had a very busy, successful medical practice. So when I was diagnosed with stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1990, it was as if a storm had descended on my life. My, everything that was important to me was threatened. Um, I underwent Promise Mop chemotherapy. This is me dressing up with my children before I lost my hair. This is me living with chemotherapy, celebrating birthdays and all. And then this is me after I finished my chemotherapy recovering and 
hoping to put cancer behind me. But um, as you heard, my cancer came back before my one-year checkup. Uh, I had mini mantle radiation. It put it into remission. A couple of months after my radiation, my symptoms recurred. Uh, new research suggested, and the scans were still clear, so new research suggested that the addition of interferon might prolong that remission. So I did interferon um, for four months. I was absolutely miserable. And when I went for my checkup, it was one of those bad news, good news things. The bad news was that my cancer was back. And the good news was we could stop the interferon. And it was at that point that um, I faced a bad pro long-term prognosis. Statistics put my life expectancy at less than two years. And because I'm a doctor, it was an advantage. I knew how to evaluate medical information and make a treatment decision. So I did what I used to do with my complicated patients in my solo practice. I made myself a chart that weighed the advantages and the disadvantages, the pluses and the minuses of my treatment options. And this was when I'd narrowed it down to my last, my final four um, treatments. And the details are not important. The reason I put it up there was to show you the pattern. All those plus signs uh, in the chemotherapy and the bone marrow transplant columns for response, all the minus signs uh, in those columns, and all the question marks over the trial columns. And as he mentioned, there was a very prominent uh, lymphoma specialist on the East Coast whom I'd seen for a second opinion who basically said, you are making a mistake if you enter a clinical trial when we know that high-dose chemotherapy can get your cancer into remission. Well, I'd need an hour to explain exactly how I arrived at my treatment decision, but one of the reasons was after that interferon, which had made me so anorectic, I was quite underweight, I was very deconditioned, and I thought, well, I'll do this trial at Stanford, and even if it doesn't work, it may buy me four, eight, 16 weeks to put on some weight and get a little bit in condition off the interferon so that I could have my bone marrow transplant. And in fact, I was even scheduled for a transplant. My marrow was already, uh, in the bank at, at Baylor in Dallas, but you saw that it worked. Um, and I, when I travel around the country, this is one of the key ways that I try to thank you for the work you did for me. Um, and the advantage I had as a physician, as a scientist, is that I understood the difference between knowledge obtained from anecdote versus knowledge obtained from observation versus knowledge obtained from clinical trials from science. So um, let's see. So I went to California. I, I entered the trial. I went to California. I'm not sure what my next slide is. Oh, I know what it is. I travel and I talk about finding happiness in a storm, finding happiness, getting good care, and then finding happiness in the life you have. This is my personal picture of happiness in a storm. It was taken the first Sunday afternoon in June 1993 at a National Cancer Survivors Day celebration in Dallas. Now, on my bed at home was a suitcase packed to travel to Stanford to participate in that first phase one trial. I'm a doctor. I'm a scientist. I knew that, statistically speaking, this was the beginning of the end for me. But because of research, I had hope that new treatments would become available that could save my life. And that hope tamed my fear of tomorrow so that I could embrace the today I had. The next slide, um, I just put these together last night in the hotel. The next slide shows me, after receiving my first dose, waking up the, the next morning in the uh, Holiday Inn after receiving that first dose of IDEX C2B8. And again, to give you a little bit of perspective, I had promised MOP chemotherapy in 1990 and 1991, an era that some of us chemo veterans referred to as the BZ era, before Zofran. Zofran, the little tablet. Let me put it this way for the young doctors who really don't quite grasp the impact of this. I had chemo in 1990 and 1991 before Zofran. I had another round of chemotherapy in 1995 after Zofran. The difference in my quality of life was so dramatic that my husband had to talk me out of replacing the gemstone in my engagement ring with a Zofran tablet. <laughs> anyway, so I'd had chemotherapy that made me really sick. 
I'd had radiation therapy that gave me terrible esophagitis. I felt really sick. And then I had interferon, which I told you made me miserable. So I fly out to Stanford. I get this novel therapy. We don't know what to expect. Um, we have the post-treatment scans. I go back to the Holiday Inn, and I wake up the next morning. Nothing hurts. I wonder if I'm still alive. Well, I traveled back to Dallas, where we threw pennies and wishing wells, hoping the treatment would work. Um, I'm trying to remember what my next slide is. Uh, oh, yes. I used humor to try to help me deal with the stress of survivorship. So here I am, my first day back in Dallas after the treatment, and I faxed Dr. Maloney and his nurse, Tina Marie, this slide. David, Tina Marie, it's me, Wendy. Something's gone terribly wrong because it's a part mouse chimeric antibody. Um, every time I came back to Stanford for my checkups with Dr. David Maloney, I wore a different pair of mouse earrings. Um, this is a slide that summarizes my medical history. And it's the slide doctors use to summarize my life since 1990. It's a very useful slide for reviewing my medical history and making treatment decisions. But to consider this my survivorship is to miss the meaning behind the work that Dr. Levy does. All those years I was getting treatment, I was in and out of remission. I had birthdays and Mother's Days. I got to see my son get his braces on. I got to have, see him get his braces off. I watched an awful lot of volleyball. I put this slide in here because it was my Cinderella moment. It was the evening that I was inducted into the Texas Women's Hall of Fame because then Governor George W. Bush um, gave me the uh, Governor's Award for Health because of my books. And I put it up there not because I got to dress in a floor-length fancy gown or because I got to walk under an arch of sabers held by very handsome cadets, but because I got to publicly thank my local oncologist Dr. James Strauss, and the two researchers who saved my life, Dr. Levy and Dr. Maloney. And um, I told Dr. Levy last week, when he invited me to come here today, that if every once in a while his, his ears were burning, he never knew I used this slide. I use this slide in every one of my talks. And uh, so I've been thanking you over and over again. I got to see homecoming. I got to see May 1993, the high school graduation of my oldest child. This was a day that when I entered the trial, I could not even think about because it was too far away. It was too unlikely that I would be there. Traveling around the country, doing patient advocacy work, raising money for lymphoma research. That was May 2007, high school graduation of my middle. This is May of this year, high school graduation of my baby. And those babies who were one, three, and five when I was diagnosed, who were three, five, and seven when I flew to Stanford to become a subject in a clinical trial, are now 18, 20, and 22. And they are very happy. Um, I can't remember. So, in summary, there's a saying that I believe is from the Talmud, if you save one life, you save a world. Your work saved my world. And words cannot express my gratitude. All I can do is travel around and try to teach people about the value of science-based knowledge um, to support clinical research, um, because we still have so much work yet to be done. I'm hoping you can come up here, because um, I've seen Dr. Levy, if you could join me. Dr. Levy has scads, a collection of awards and honors and plaques and trophies and all these wonderful things. But I noticed you were missing two things. And my children insisted that I bring them for you. One is to thank you for saving me. One is, I think he needs an armadillo. That's just to remind you of your Dallas-Texas connection. And the other thing he needed, and when my husband saw what I was bringing for Dr. Levy, he said, he saved your life. What, do you want him to kill you now? Your very own 
Dallas Cowboys hat. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. I, I was impressed on the fact that we needed to save time so that everyone would have a chance to ask questions and discuss what you heard today. So we deliberately pared it down, made it fast. <laughs> so now it's open. Yes, Dimitri. Lana, you talk interestingly about this, you know, exquisitely tailored per person approach, and now we've sort of gone to big, big business sort of one size fits all the different uh, approaches. So what's happened to the personalized approach to antibody treatment? Hardly a day. Did everyone hear that? Hardly a day goes by that. Uh, uh, what about making a customized uh, antibody for people? Uh, what happened to that? Hardly a day goes by that uh, someone doesn't ask me about that, including patients who want me to do it for them. And uh, it's pretty frustrating, actually, to admit that uh, we had an idea that was, I think, still a great idea, but it was uh, unfeasible on, a, on a, a repetitive basis over long term. There is another approach we're working on, uh, which is a vaccine approach where we don't make an antibody, but we make the product from the patient's own tumor and give it back to them as a vaccine and get them to make their own antibodies. That is a clinical trial now which is quite mature, and we're going to hear the results of it at the end of this year. Our fingers are crossed that this is going to work, and that customized approach will, will have another, another version, uh, and that's what I referred to, and I said maybe next time I give grand rounds we'll talk about that. Yes, yeah, Stanley. I, I, thanks for that comment. I, I totally agree with that, and I feel frustrated that this moat between academia and industry is as wide as it is. I think we need to make it narrower. I think we need to uh, enhance the transition back and forth so that we can develop our discoveries and so that we can test the new agents that are coming from industry and so that we can make things to inject into people from our own labs and our own discoveries. And uh, I tend to work on that pretty hard. Ron, let me ask you a question about uh, if I understood it correctly, the pivotal trial that earned FDA approval had relatively modest evidence for effectiveness. Um, it later became clear that there was a quite remarkable and broad-based effectiveness for the uh, antibody. Today, of course, the FDA is ratcheting up the standards for the requirements for approval uh, on the basis of effectiveness. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on uh, what the implications of the change in FDA perspective, if I understand it correctly, uh, is having on the uh, field that uh, you're involved in, especially as you think about this benefit to risk ratio that uh, uh, doesn't get as much attention in the assessment of effectiveness. Yeah, I think that's a good question. We, ha we have a serious problem today with the FDA, in my opinion, and Richard Miller has been writing a lot about this in op-ed pieces in the Wall Street Journal lately. Uh, at the time that rituxan was approved, uh, there was only one other drug approved for the treatment of lymphoma, and not a very good drug called fludarabine. All the other treatments that we were, uh, had in practice at the time had never really been approved by the FDA for this, for this disease. They were approved for other things and became standard of practice. So it didn't have much to go up against at the time, and it had the lack of toxicity that I referred to. That, so the cost-benefit equation was way in favor of, of this drug, uh, even though the efficacy evidence at the time was not overwhelming. And uh, so I think that led to the approval of the drug. Today, with that kind of data, uh, you could not, oh good, uh, you could not um, 
get a drug approved with that kind of data today. Uh, the, the standards, as you said, have been moving. It's a moving target. Uh, we've seen some drugs fail at the level of the FDA with much better uh, kind of ev uh, efficacy evidence than we had for rituximab back then, although, albeit, with more toxicity. But I think that, that uh, we're in a situation now where, where there's a kind of a one-size-fits-all fits all approval process where uh, statistical power, the magical p-value, um, the uh, applying of the same criteria, whether it's, a, it's a, as Richard has written, as whether it's a treatment for toenail fungus or a treatment for life-threatening disease. Uh, we have to customize our approach to the data and to the, and to the indications and, and uh, uh, lobby the FDA to, to loosen the standards. Yeah, cancer stem cells are, are quite popular, as you heard from Irv Weissman when he gave his grand rounds, and everyone's searching for the stem cells of every, every kind of cancer. Uh, the assay uh, to search for those stem cells is not easy. You have to grow the cells in, a, in another environment, like an immunodeficient mouse, and you have to find the population, uh, the small population within the big tumor population that actually can grow and identify the genes of those cells and the properties of those cells. With lymphoma, that's been hard to transplant into nude mice, uh, surprisingly enough. Um, but uh, if there were a cancer stem cell, and if it were the only cell that you needed to attack, then if you could get your hands on that cell, you could, uh, you could study its properties, find the Achilles heel within that cell, use it as a vaccine, which is my favorite idea, uh, to turn it into a vaccine to immunize the patient against the cancer stem cell as opposed to the whole uh, cancer. So this is an ongoing research project, and I think it's a, a meritorious idea. Well, one of my answers to your question is, look over here. Uh, Long-term use of rituximab, uh, no downside. Uh, there have been some uh, indications with, now that the drug has been in widespread use, there are at low frequencies some problems with infectious complications and some leukopenia that's under, un, unexplained late occurring after exposure to the drug. There have been some recrudescence of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, JC virus with uh, PML. Uh, these are rare, but they do occur, and uh, every drug, no matter how uh, benign it looks uh, initially, in long-term use is going to find some complications somewhere. But I think that the, the record is pretty, uh, it's pretty good, actually, for, for this one. Now, I don't know about the improved versions. When we get stronger, better binders to the target, better binders to the FC uh, 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 killer cells, uh, whether it's going to be a whole new, whole new question to be examined once we get a uh, another version in, in the clinic. Dr. Blau? So one thing that uh, when it's struck by the relapses that Wendy, for instance, had, what are the prospects for treatment without this risk of relapse? Well, one of the ideas is this can't, yes, the question of uh, can we ever get rid of this disease, not just keep the lid on it, but actually get rid of it. Well, we know we can do that with more drastic measures. We know we can do that with, with bone marrow transplantation from another person into the subject that runs the risk of some side effects that uh, our group here is, is actively trying to figure out how to avoid. And so people can be cured uh, at, at a higher risk of, of side effects and toxicities. So we know it's possible. Uh, it's a matter of getting it right so we don't cause more damage in the process of trying to cure more people. Dr. Skeff? Wendy, thank you very, very much for coming. Uh, I wonder if the experience you've had as a physician as a patient was a powerful one. Uh, what advice do you have to give us? What things did we as a profession do right? And what things do you have as advice to us as to what we could do better when we have a physician to make it? Uh, thanks for that question. And I just want to point out to everyone in the room, all of us physicians will one day be patients. <laughs> That's a big question, and it makes up half of the work I do now. Half of my work is trying to educate patients how uh, to work well with the medical team. And the other half of my work, since I have this column in Oncology Times and all, is to talk to physicians and nurses and allied health 
about the patient side of the equation and what words and actions make a difference. Um, it's hard, there's so much to talk about, but I think the essential um, message was that of Sir Francis Peabody, which is the, care of the, the secret to the care of the patient is in caring for the patient and not treating cancer, but treating people with cancer. Many times, I know you guys are way over pressured with time constraints and too much work and too much information and too much paperwork, but many times, using one phrase or one word instead of another, many times, just <laughs> offering the patient some hope will make a huge difference in that patient's quality of life between treatments, will make a huge difference in terms of what treatment the patient chooses, and lastly, will make a huge difference in your patients helping you help them. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.